and I am excited. We've got just a couple more weeks. Uh, I want to just emphasize uh, camp right now because if you are not or you have someone that is not signed up, uh, Friday it goes up 50 bucks if someone signs up after that date. So you, please, please, please make sure that there is an emphasis this week. And so I'll be, I'll be texting some people and calling them. But the best thing you could do, to, just so you know, is just to pray for them. Uh, we've seen victories. Audrey texted me about Madison. Oh, my goodness. What a hallelujah. I was pumped up, none to say the least. It was just awesome. And all I did, I didn't invite her. I mean, I know Audrey did and trying to, to do things. But, man, I was praying. So God will send uh, who he wants to be at camp. So, uh, But make sure people know just this week, uh, if you if people are planning on going, just make sure hey, by Friday, if they by the end of Friday, midnight on Friday, if they have not signed up, it's it'll be more money. And so especially people if they need help, because I'm not paying the extra 50 if they want help to, to go. Uh, I know that there's some people ask that, but I will not pay the extra 50. So even if they, um, you know, they all that. So anyway, uh, make sure uh, that is on your radar. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the ability, uh, the hour of Bible study we have. Uh, your word's awesome. i um, just amazed at it and what it teaches us and the things it will show us just about ourselves and then about the precious cross of Calvary. Um, thank you for um, just a Sunday morning, the Lord's Day. It's just awesome to gather in your house today. Thank you for young people just having a desire, whether they come here uh, voluntarily or they were forced to. I just pray that you would touch our hearts to, to learn this scripture today. Give us wisdom. I need it. You know, God, those things I lack, and I pray that you would help us to understand more about this book, uh, especially Romans. We dive into it today. We need, we need you now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. So uh, if you were in church last week, we were all upstairs. I just kept on going, but we, we kind of focused in on this patience um, in uh, chapter 5, verses uh, 1 through uh, 4 or 5. And I just kind of focused, honed in. That's where God kind of led me to. But um, I want to skip down and start in verse number 12. And we're going to try to kind of just read through this. 5, 6, and 7, there's a lot in there. But uh, some of the things that pop up because we just read through it, that's what's really amazing. Oh, does it, anybody have any questions? Have I been reading and have a question? Want me to try to cover? Ellie, you got any ears you want me to try to cover? Huh? Oh, okay. All right. All right. Ellie said she's got like 10 questions. And I'm like, well, let's cover them. I'm not afraid. Do you remember any of them? Actually, I am got kind of scared. Some of the questions you ask, I'm pretty scared of, but. If you remember it, what? Yeah. Yeah. We only have access. Watch this. Go to Romans, or not Romans. Hold your place here just to show you this quick. Go to uh, Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. Um, does he only hear the prayer of Christians? Yeah. Uh, the only prayer he, he'll hear, he will hear from someone who's a sinner or someone who's not, not been born again, is that prayer of salvation. That's what he hears. And so you're like, well, man, that sounds pretty awful. No, actually, it's the holiness of God. If he let anything come into his presence uh, without holiness, he wouldn't be holy anymore. We know that from Amos. Amos said, is it Amos? Uh, no, it wasn't Amos. It was Habakkuk. Yes, Habakkuk. No, it wasn't Habakkuk. Or it's Haggai. It's Haggai. I'm sorry. Haggai. Sorry. <laughs> but um, Haggai said, he told the priest that if something is holy and, and, something, and it touches something unholy, does the unholy thing become holy? He says, no. What happens is the holy thing then becomes unholy. It's like a dirty hand. If you have my, my uh, boys, I took them to the farm this past week and they were rolling around in dust and dirt. It was fantastic. He, my, my dad, he was, he was, he's like, they're in the, look at them. They're a mess. I'm like, amen. That's what I'm talking about. 
playing tic-tac-toe. Anyway, if they take the dusty hand and they shake my hand, which is clean, it doesn't make their hand clean. It makes my hand dirty. So if God said, I let anybody come into uh, before me and pray sinners, then it, there would be an unholiness to that. So you have to be holy. That's why here's the prayer of, for salvation or the, the belief of salvation. But what always reminds me someone says that is Cornelius. Ch- Acts chapter 10, there's a guy named Cornelius. He's a Gentile. He's not a Jew. But um, verse number, uh, where's that? Hold on. Uh, ver- go to verse number uh, 23. Uh, maybe not. Uh, it says, then he, uh, I'm, I'm just going to kind of read this till I find this verse. Then called he them and lodged them. This t- Peter came and he visits Cornelius. On the morrow, Peter went away to them, a certain brethren from Joppa accompanied them. And after morrow, they entered into Caesarea and Cornelius waited for them and had called together his kinsmen, his near friends. He knew they were coming. So he, he called together and had a party. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshiped him. But Peter took him up saying, stand up. I myself also am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together. Oh, wait, wait, wait. That's not it. Uh, it's before that. Go to chapter 10, verse 1. Sorry, chapter 10, verse 1. It says, There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of a band called the Italian band, a devout man, one that feareth God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. So right there he said, he's praying. Oh, yeah, someone's calling me. Okay, verse 3. He saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day, so he's praying an angel of God coming unto him and saying, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? And he said, thy prayers and thy alms are come up for a, what? Memorial before God. It doesn't say God heard them. It said there's a memorial that there's something going on there, but it does not say that his prayers and alms or his prayers are heard by God. It just says there were a memorial before him. And so I don't know exactly how that goes on in heaven, but whether God, uh, an angel gets these or hears these and tells God, hey, this guy's praying, that's the memorial. I want to bring it to your memory, God, that this guy's talking to you, but he cannot come to God unless there's salvation first. Okay? That's what I always remember. All right? Good question. Okay, Romans chapter 5. Any other ones? Romans 5. So... We looked at uh, patience, and then he gets in verse 12, and he start, 12 through 21 in the chapter, he starts to um, give some comparison of things. And so this can get mighty confusing if you don't slow down and just kind of read it. But he, he starts to mention this guy named Adam. Anybody ever heard of Adam? You know, the first man that ever lived, you know, that guy, yeah. So watch what he says in verse 12. As for, wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin... And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So this is the, the Bible definition or the biblical way of understanding what we call a sin nature. So if I said that when a child is born, I know I've said this many times, if I say a child is born and you ask if you throw a cookie on a table and you tell the, the child, do not touch that cookie, and you walk out of the room and what's the child going to do? He's going to touch the cookie. You come back in, he eats the cookie. And you come back in, you say, did you eat that cookie? What's he going to say? With chocolate all over his face. No. no way. All right. He's going to say no way. Now, who taught that child to lie? No one taught that child to lie. I didn't teach my kids sit down and go, now, here's how you lie to your mom. We're going to really get her this time. I didn't do that to my kids. And no one taught you how to lie. You just automatically knew it. As we would say, it was in your nature. So the depravity or the, the sinful nature of man is inherited by your father. That is what the Bible teaches. This verse says, for as by one man, sin entered into the world. And so this is kind of where uh, Paul is going with the Romans. He's trying to get them to understand where sin comes from. So what's the one man by which sin came into the world? Adam. 
I seen someone lip it, but they didn't say it out loud, so they don't get the points. Correct. All right. So Adam was the man by which all sin came in to the world. There was no sin, but by Adam. Now this sometimes can cause a little confusion because who sinned first? Eve did. So if Eve sinned first, then why was did sin come into the world by Adam alone? <laughs> now you got to finish your sentence. Uh, Cause Jesus and the well, I'm not gonna say it now. (laughs) Yes, so that you're on the right track because Adam. That's how sin comes upon all people, is through Adam. That's what that verse says. And she said Jesus didn't have sin because he didn't have an earthly father. That's exactly right. That is that is the theology of why Jesus could be sinless, but no one else could. You're exactly on that point. But why, why did um, Eve get skipped over? What? Yep. Yep. First Timothy chapter number two talks about Eve being beguiled. She was tricked into sinning. Adam did it of his own self. He said that there was no beguiling. It just said he, she gave him the fruit and he ate. And say so she beguiled him. Eve was beguiled. That's why Adam, that's why that happened. So all people have sin, a sin nature because of Adam. Okay? You are all born with it. We have a tendency to sin. That is what we go to. You give a dog a bone. You try to take the bone away from the dog. What's he do? Huh? Fights back. He wants that bone. You didn't teach him that, but that's in their nature. Everything that God, we have a nature. So that's what verse 12, look at verse 13. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin was not imputed when there was no law. So uh, Adam sinned was the Ten Commandments around when Adam sinned. Nope, nope. And he goes on, look at verse 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come, but not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one, many be dead. So there's a lot in there. I'm going to try to just stick on course because, man, there is just, there's just so much in there. But it, what he's saying is, did people die? Uh, who brought the Ten Commandments? What man? Moses. Moses. Okay. Moses brought the Ten Commandments. And so what he just said was the, the law, and we'll see, go, go to verse 20, 20 uh, look at verse 20 of that chapter. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might, what? Abound. So he's, wh- why did the law come to show us we have offended God, that it He says, the law entered that the offense might abound, that we have offended God, that it shows us how much we've offended God. 693, I always get those numbers mixed up, or 39, 639 laws, and no one can, how about just the Ten Commandments? No one keeps them. What, What is that? The law abounding, that the law entered to show us that sin abounds in our life. We can't keep that stuff. That's what happened. But death still came and people still died from Adam to Moses. I'm going to preach one time. I don't know when God's going to let me, but one of the worst chapter or people say the worst chapters to read is like Genesis chapter five, where all it is is a bunch of names. But at the end of every one of those names, it says, and he died every one of them. And I'm going to preach that whole chapter one time. I don't know when it is, but anyway, death is still happening to people. Well, the law is what shows us that we die because of sin. And that's the judgment for our sin. He says, but that, the de- just because we don't know what to do or that r- there's something in, I can't get to, there's a moral compass within us that tells us right and wrong. Keep reading. So that, that's what he's talking about. And he says in verse number um, uh, 15, uh, says, but not, but not as the offense, so also as a free gift, for through the offense of one, many be dead. 
So what offense, what one person offended that all people died because of? What's one per, the one person that offended God and the law of God that all people die because he did that? Huh? Yes. I'm just making sure you're all on the same page. Everybody's, everybody's like, is this a trick question? No, I just want you to, that's what he's talking about. Because of Adam, we all have offended and we all die. Now look at the verse. Um, and uh, let's see, where, where did I say? Verse 15. It says, for if the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. So what he's doing is he's saying, this one Adam caused sin. Then he says, there's a one other man. And that's what verse number, uh, if you look at verse uh, for, uh, 14, where's that at? Yeah, 14. Look at verse 14. I know, I know it's a lot. You just gotta, this is Sunday school. I'm expecting y'all to learn a little something, okay? Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after, after the similitude of Adam's transgression. Watch. Who what is the figure of him that is to come? He said, Adam is just a, a shadow or a figure of who's going to come. So what he's starting to do is compare these two people. And he said, here's Adam, one, everybody sinned. But be, God said, one man all sinned. He also said, by one man, one man all people can be righteous. And that's what he's starting to, to show you. Go, go verse 16. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification for if by one man's offense death reigned by one much more they which received abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one jesus christ so what he's doing is showing the uh the grace and the mercy of god because uh we can look back and say that ain't fair that my great 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 grandfather sin and I'm I will I'm dying because he sinned because that's what the Bible's teaching. I'm gonna die because he sinned and gave me a a a nature to sin. Now you sin because you choose to sin. I get that but you had a nature because of him. That's not fair. What God's saying is Oh, yeah, it is, because just by one man, you all can be maybe righteous. It ain't many men. It isn't, oh, there's multiple men. He said just by one. So by one we sin, but by one we can be sanctified. So that's what he's kind of showing here, okay? Verse 18. Therefore, as, the, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, so even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men in the justification of life. Do you guys see the comparison? I'm not... I'm not going to try to go over all these things to dissect them, but he's just showing a comparison. Condemnation, but then a free gift to life. Jesus. Moses gave it. Okay. Or I mean, Adam gave it. Verse 19. For by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. I mean, just think of this. If, if, if you said by one man's disobedience, all people sin, if it had to be, if it says, well, if your grandpa was in obedience, then you could be saved. But if he was in disobedience, you can't be saved. You'd be like, well, I was doomed before I ever got born. That, that's what he means. But because Jesus was obedient and it only has to be one, there's the gift. Okay. All right. Not that everybody looked at me like they understood that, but I'm just going to go on. So verse 20 says, moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. So. If you're going to look at the law, Moses, why did this law, why did that come into, do I get in this later? Yes, I do. Okay. Forget this. And let's go to chapter six. Okay. Look at chapter six. So all this, all this gift and receiving of, of Jesus and being saved. Uh, you ever heard someone say, oh, well, if you haven't, I'll tell you. Some people think because we believe in eternal security that I believe that once I'm saved, I'm always saved. I can never be go to hell again. They say this, 
Well, you're just giving people a license to sin. Here you go, sin all you want. No, we're not. And that's what he covers, because this is what Paul's saying. Man, it's free gift. Isn't it awesome? You don't have to earn it. You can just receive it. And he just, in his mind, I could see him going, people may think they can just go ahead and sin. Look at chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Now, I want you to get just a couple different pictures out of, out of this. Uh, how many of you have never sinned after you got saved? I was hoping no one would raise their hand right there. Okay, so after you got saved, and I tell people this all the time, I've sinned more after I got saved than before I got saved. I got saved when I was 13 years old. At, how old am I now? Like 33? 30 years. I've been saved 30 years this November. That's crazy. How old are you, Nate? The only person, good morning. Oh, someone get him some chairs, can you? The only person in here, I'm not going to do that. Okay, <clears throat> there's two people, but I, I won't say that. I, I've been, so 30 uh, years of, so I've sinned more. And so here's what he's just kind of uh, showing us. For chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we sin, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? So I want to show you guys just the thought of, the, when, when he says, if we sin, if we slip up, and this is what I wrote, a dominion, a reigning, and a continuing of sin is different than a slipping up of sin. Because a lot of people think just because I've sinned after I got saved, that now I'm not saved. There's a big difference between, and the Bible says, continuing in sin. A continual sin, Okay. Um, not, not, uh, sin and then stop and then sin again. That's not continual. That's a, you slipped up and then you slip up again. There's a big difference. And he says this in a couple places. Look at chapter six, verse number one. He says, you continue. Look at chapter six, verse 12, Romans, Romans chapter six, verse 12. He says, let not sin therefore. And what's the word there? Reign in your mortal body. You see that? And then look at verse 14. For sin shall not have, what? Dominion over you. Do you see the difference? So if we were looking at a sin, uh, someone who sins, we all sin. We all have got things that we, they, where we slip up, we trip up on. But the, the, the outlier or the outline that God has tried to give us in Romans chapter 6 is there will be no continuing of sin. Okay? So if uh, I just take my life, for example, I was in sin before I got right with God and God would not let me continue in sin because I'm his child. That would be like me, um, my, one of my kids having a, a torch that's on fire and it's burning down and they just hold the torch and I'm just sitting there watching them going, oh, this is going to be fun when it gets down to the hand. And, you know, you'd be like, you're a horrible parent. I know. I'd be like, drop the stinking torch, you idiot. Don't hold on to it, you know, or hold it like this. Or at least, you know, I, I don't know. But if you're holding on and you're like, oh, it's going to burn them, you're going to say, stop, let go. Don't hold on to that. That's what God does in discipline. If we're in sin, God will discipline us because he doesn't want us to be destroyed. And sin will destroy you. That's a continual sin. So he's saying here in chapter 6, verse 1, shall we continue in sin? The, look at verse 6, or j ch chapter 6, verse 1. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And verse 2 says this, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Just get this picture. He's, he's trying to say, worse but dead, sin is dead to us. And so he said, why in the world would we let sin on us or let sin have dominion over us or let sin continue in us if we're supposed to be dead to it. And so this is what I think of. You ready? You ever seen, guys ever seen dead deer alongside the road? Yeah. Pretty awesome, isn't it? Right? Oh, man, I drive by, drove by one the other day, and I mean, I couldn't see the, or I could still see the top of his fur, but his fur was covered in flies. Disgusting. You know, they're just, God made flies. You hate flies, but he made it for a reason. They eat up all that stuff. Anyway, so 
But this is what I'm thinking. None of us would stop, strip the carcass off of that. Not even hunters would do this. Of that dead animal. No, you wouldn't. Liar. Uh, don't, no, okay. Of a dead animal that's been laying there, you're not going to strip the carcass off of it and then throw it over your shoulders and wear it around and go, look at this beautiful thing. Look at this. No, no one would do that, okay? I know there's some pretty hardcore guys here, but we used to, the worst that we've ever come was when we used to, to skin coons out um, when, when I was younger. My brother, we'd see roadkill, a uh, coon laying on the side of the road, and we'd pick it up and take it and go skin it out. But we wouldn't wear it. We'd skin it out because the skins were worth about anywhere from 20 to 30 bucks a piece. And so it's just basically a $20 bill. Anyway, okay. So no one would pick that up and wear that over them. You wouldn't have it, let it have dominion over you. You wouldn't let that have that dead. And that's what he's saying. We're dead to sin. Sin may get on us, but it's yucky. And so go over to Jude. I just popped my head, so I'm going to go there. Go to, the, to Jude. Jude's the next to last book of the Bible. So turn to Revelation and turn back, and you'll find a little book of Jude. And watch this. He says, how in the world are we going to have to let sin have dominion when we're supposed to be dead from sin? And this is what he's trying to teach us is that Adam, one man, all, everybody's in sin because of Adam, but all men can be freed from sin by Jesus Christ. And once you're in Jesus, you are dead to what caused you to get in this predicament. You're dead to it. It's dead to you. So you could, you'll trip up, you'll slip up, but he's like this continual thing, either you continue, you continue in it and God says, well, then I'm going to have to discipline him or you slip up and say, oh, and this is how you do it. Cause people are like, how do I get to a point where I don't want to continue in sin? I think there's always going to be a want to continue in sin because you still have the flesh. So there's going to be something, a part of you that's going to be like, I want to sin and I want to sin a lot. But you don't stay in there because you're freed from it. Look at Jude. Uh, verse number um, uh, verse number 19. Look at verse number 19. It says, These be they who separate themselves, sensual having not the Spirit. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. And some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. Watch, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. So Jude gives us a picture, and I'm just, this isn't really teaching, I'm just preaching a little bit or trying to, to show you. But he says, how do we get to a point where sin's yucky? He said, there's got to be a hatred for that. And not a hatred when it gets on you, a hatred that it gets on a piece of clothing that's on you. I mean, no, no man, hear about this. No man goes up to a dead rotting carcass of a deer, takes off his shirt, and then takes a dead carcass and goes, ah, this is great. It's going to keep me warm. No one does that. He says you get to a point in your life where if something splashes on you, you're spotted by the uh, sinfulness or the, the thoughts of the flesh, and you go, ah. And my wife and spiders, you know, completely unhinged if a big black spider gets around her. I mean, she hates it. And so this is the spottedness. Jude says, find a hatred. Here's how it helped me. Ready? When I started following the Lord and I had to get some things right in my life, I had to get some things out of it, just years of continual sin, is I asked God, give me a hatred for it. Give me a hatred for that sin. And he did, because he will, because he doesn't want it on you. And so ask for that. God, give me a hatred for that. And that's when you slip up. You're like, man, but you don't continue because you're like, I didn't want to do that. And he gets later on and, and go, go back to Romans, go back to Romans. I was going to say later on in Romans, maybe we get to it today if I hurry myself up. So in chapter six, he talks, what he's trying to do is, it's trying to give you some motivation to not continue in sin. To not have sin have dominion over you. You don't continue in it. It doesn't reign in you. And you don't have dominion over it. 
Something that reigns is something that has control over you. That's the thought. If a king reigns, he has control. Sin can take, as a Christian, sin can control you. Can control what you do. Control, you wake up in the morning, you're thinking, how can I get to where I can do this sin? You uh, get around certain people. I can't wait to get around these people because this is what causes me to sin. That is a, that's sin reigning in you. It has authority over you. It's why you do what you do. Okay. Just some practical preaching, a little bit of, of preaching, but just practical. That's what he's, he's trying to give you some motivation. Look at verse eight, uh, verse seven. Sorry. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall live with him. Look at verse four. I didn't do this one. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism unto death. He says, your baptism shows that you're putting away of this filth of the flesh, that like as Christ was raised from, up from the dead by the glory of the Father, so even so we also should walk in newness of life. Have you all been baptized? Been saved and baptized? When you got baptized, what you did was you said to God and to the witnesses, I am burying the old man and I'm putting on a new kind of man. I'm not going to walk the way the old man wants to anymore. I'm a new, I have newness. I went from one man, Adam, to now I'm righteous by one man, Jesus. That's what he's saying. There's this picture of that. But verse number nine now, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, because Christ did this, Reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Everybody get in this picture? Get away from the dead thing and be alive in Jesus. That's a comparison. Is everybody getting this so far? Okay, is it too, am I going too slow? Can I speed up? No one answered me at all. You all just looked at me. Okay. Uh, and so this is verse 15. What then shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace. Where does he get that? Verse 14. I should have read that. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under law, but under grace. So here's, here we go. Uh, questions and all these of Old Testament, New Testament. He says, well, the, are we under law? Is that what dispensation we're under? If you don't know what dispensation is, it's just how God uh, uh, brings people to a knowledge of himself. And so the law is what they used to live on, and it's what they were under, people. They would look at the law, the Ten Commandments, and they'd say, God exists because there's a moral law. And he says, once we're under grace. So let me ask you this. You ready? When did we get under the period of grace? When did we get under the period? When did it go from law? And I'm not going to go through all the dispensations. And then all of a sudden, now we're, it says we're under grace. So no, God no longer says, hey, uh, I'm going to sh show me that you love me by keeping these things. Now, you can. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. But that's not how God looks at us. Instead, he looks at us underneath the lens of grace. I'm going to give you grace. I'll give you grace. Uh, Deuteronomy says, if you disobey your parents three times, they stone you with stones that you die. I wouldn't be alive. Praise God, I'm under the law, right? I'm not under all those things. Hallelujah. I'm under grace. When did that happen? What? I hear. <laughs> what? When is it? It's Jesus. Right? The death of Christ gave us grace now. So now we're living under grace. He's like, well, praise God. We're, we're, we're under grace. We're not underneath the law. We don't have to keep the law. That's what he's saying. Look at verse 15. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Verse 16. Know you not that to whom you yield yourself servants to obey, his servants are, you, are ye whom you obey. So then he gets into this word called yield. Now, y'all know what yield is? Please learn before you drive. Because no one in this generation knows what yield is. Absolutely no one. So... If you got those big upside down triangle signs that say yield, y'all know them? You know what you're supposed to do? Here, I'll just give you a little lesson. So you'll be ahead of the car. What? Speed up. Speed up. Yeah, so you guys. So if you're traveling on 33 and then here's this 
this little on-ramp thingy majiggy where you're coming up and that's what most people do they swerve like that and it says right here yield idiot it says that in fine print below it all right so uh, yield idiot right there this person that's coming on here has to stop if there's someone right beside them and you're going like this they these guys <laughs> not these guys have to stop if they cannot get in it is not these guys responsibilities i'm pretty bitter about this but anyway to stop and let you in you are to stop i one of the greatest things you'll ever learn is this when you get beside a semi because a semi does not care you can run right into him and i've seen it before people are like and you could tell entitled generation they get beside a semi and they're driving and the semi is just right here because he can't get over and let him in and they just keep driving and I've watched them, I'm like, they're going to wreck. And sure enough, they're just driving because they're not paying attention to what's beside them. They're like, I'm getting on. And then they go, oh, there's a big white thing beside me. And then they're off in the gravel in the ditch. Did I tell you I'm pretty bitter about some of this? But anyway, <laughs> yielding is that you are submitting to what's already going on. So he says, we're not under the law. Do we have to keep the law then? This is, this is what he's saying. Verse number 15. What then? Shall we sin or don't keep the law because we are not under the law but under grace? He says, God forbid. Actually, you need to continue to yield to the law. Now, the law is not uh, like what car you're in to get to heaven, but it is what you are to yield to. So if you come to a point in your life where the law and you are going to collide, you have to yield to the law. So people say this, that's Old Testament, I don't have to keep it. Yeah, you do. That's what you just said right there. You need to yield to the law. What's Old Testament? Do we really have to, 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 do, you know, to do that? Yeah. You need to yield to the law. So some of these Old Testament verses that people are like, uh, we don't have to follow that, we're under grace. Yeah, you do. That's what he's saying. We're under grace, praise God. That's why you're to yield to it. Are you still to obey your parents? I just want to hear everybody say it. yes to that. Are you still to obey your parents? I think I heard my kids say that. Okay, there we go. All right. <laughs> Make sure. Uh, but are we going to stone you if you don't? No. <laughs> Audra, the fact that you're alive means no, all right? 100%. Uh, she's, she's two working on three, disobedience, you know, that's all. Yeah, we're still not got three yet. All right, so, but what, so wait a minute. What's that? That's called grace. You see, you're to yield and do those things, but the grace is you don't die because you do do them. The grace is there. Is everybody, everybody grasping this so far? Okay, now. Verse number, um, uh, verse 17. So, so watch this guys. If ever someone says to you, I don't, uh, I don't have to do that because it's old Testament. That's in Levit that's Levitical law. Just take them these verses and say, what well, says you're still to yield to the law. Again, if you decide I'm not going to do that, you're not killed. We don't go out and stone you. That's the grace of it. Okay. It's not that we're not to follow. It's the grace of it. Okay. Verse 17. But God be thanked that you were servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which is delivering you, being made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. So he's still talking about this yielding. Verse number um, 20. Well, no, I'm sorry, verse 19. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members. Okay, what's your members? Your body. More specifically, the things, the extremities. Your hands, your eyes, your ears, your mouth, and what you touch, what you taste, what you smell, what you hear, what you see, them are your members. And he says, you've yielded your members, look at the verse, servants to uncleanness, that's what you used to do, and iniquity and iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. So the Bible still wants us to be holy. Praise God. All right? Is everybody getting this so far? All right? 
And so all this, and then he goes in verse 23, for the wages of sin is death. Motivation. This, you're going to die. But the gift of God is eternal life through, you see the comparison? Chapters 5 and 6, he's trying to compare. Not verse, chapter 7. Verse number, uh, if you go chapter, chapter 7, 1 through about, Five or six talks about a woman if her husband dies. Verse, look at verse two. For if the woman which had an, had hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband, so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. This is where we get the thought and the doctrine that if you are married and we say till death, do us part. That someone can get remarried after their spouse is dead. And that's okay with God. But what's he talking? What's he trying to compare it to? He's trying to compare that if <clears throat> she's bound by the law as long as she's married. But if that law dies, <clears throat> if that person dies, she's not bound to that law anymore. So... You and I are bound by law into death until we get freed from it by Jesus. And then we live in the freedom of freeness. There you go. <clears throat> so verse 7, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. So what's the law for? Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law said, thou shalt not covet. If you're taking notes... Write down um, Galatians chapter 3, verse 24 and 25. It says this, that we are under a schoolmaster to teach us that we're sinners. And that's what the law is to us now. It's to teach you and me that we're, we're sinners. Okay? Now, watch this. Because, anybody here struggle with sin? Slip in sin? Trip over sin? All those things, right? We're in good company. Watch this. Verse number, um, uh, verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. This is the Apostle Paul. The great Apostle Paul who probably memorized the first five books of the Bible, memorized them, was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, lived, to men he lived blameless, Philippians says. No man could accuse him of sinfulness. The Apostle Paul. He said, I'm a carnal man. Carnal is just fleshly. Someone who struggles with the flesh. Struggles to do spiritual things. He says, the law is spiritual. I'm carnal. Watch verse uh, 15. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. He said, what I want to do as a spiritual man I don't allow myself to do. But the thing that I hate to do as a spiritual man, I find myself doing. Verse, keep reading. Verse 17. Now then, it is no... Uh, there's a good message right there. I'm just trying to put it in my mind so I remember it. So then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. But, so I can blame the guy, my schizophrenic friend that lives with me. It wasn't me. Mom and dad, it wasn't me that did it. It was the other guy in me, right? No, he's saying we're one. But what Paul is saying here, and this is the thought just came to my mind. Paul did not identify with the carnal man. The carnal man was a guest that would show up when he didn't want him to. Paul said, I, who I am is the spiritual man in Christ. I'm not this carnal man. It's no more me, but it's the sin that dwells in me. It's something that's still there I can't get rid of yet. And ver look at it, verse number 18. For I know that is that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth, what? What's it say? Verse 18. No good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. 
He said, I have a will to do right, but I find myself not performing that which I do right. Now, for the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that which that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Now watch. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity uh, to the law of sin, which is in my members. And he says, oh, wretched man that I am. So what he's doing here is this, what we should all do. He's trying to, to wrap this thing up. He's trying to show this oneness of Jesus and, or Adam, all sin, one Jesus being made alive. He talks about this. Hey, um, I've got a, I still got a sin nature. I still got something that I can't get rid of, something that's in me. If something's in you, you're not getting rid of it. He said, it's in me. It's a part of me. And I, it, it, it's just who I am. And he said, there's a war that goes on. The law of my mind. And I find another, another member, another something that's going on within me. And then he says, oh, wretched man that I am. The Apostle Paul. And then watch this. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? He recognizes I'm schizophrenic. Not, not as we look at it today, but he said, there is two natures in me. And they're, they're always warring. And one thing to remember, young people, you ready? The battle that you have over sin and righteousness is not a bad thing. And that's what we think. We think I'm battling, so it must be wrong. It's not wrong. Actually, if you're battling, you're in the right. It's when you cease to battle is when things start going wrong with you. He says, there's a war. And he's going to deliver me from the body of this death. And then he gives the answer, verse 25. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. So don't ever forget that you still got sin. Now watch, verse eight, chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore. Remember, if you ever see a therefore, you ought to find out why the therefore is therefore. There is now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. He goes through all this, five, chapter 5, 6, and 7, talking about all these things. We're doing bad, and man, we're still sinful, but we're not going to let it continue, or have dominion, or reign over us. And then he says, but if you're in Christ Jesus, you're not going to be condemned by God. Just an awesome. And chapter 8 is one of the greatest chapters. If you ever have a chance to memorize it, it is absolutely fantastic. It'll change the world. And so we'll try to cover that next week. Try to continue. Did I go too fast? A lot in there, but just get a concept of these things. Father, you're good. Thank you uh, that you'll deliver us from this body of death. I thank you, God, um, that the power of the Holy Spirit is more powerful than me. I pray that you would help these young people to understand um, what can cause um, their, their uh, flesh to sin. As uh, man, Ecclesiastes says, let not your mouth cause your flesh to sin. I, God, I, I pray that you'd help us. I, I sure need a daily dose every day to remind me that, man, I'm sold under sin and that I need to make the righteous man uh, more powerful. So commit these verses, these chapters to our heart. Help us to remember them, live by them in Jesus' name. Amen, amen.